Facebook. So webinar is now streaming live on Facebook. For those of you who are joining us, we will wait just a moment to confirm that we are actually being seen on both the Tijuana Estuary and on TRAN pages, Facebook pages. Um, before we get started, but well, okay. the world is littered with opportunity. If you're tuning in to see that, you are in the right spot. Um, just to, we'll just and we're alive on both pages. Very good. Awesome. Thanks, Maria. Um, so welcome to the world is littered with opportunity, which is tonight's um, presentation, part of Tijuana River Action Month. And um, this is a series of, um, normally during Tijuana River Action Month, we like to incorporate a public tour. And so this is our version of the public tour and we're breaking it up into four different Thursday evening presentations. So this is the second of the four presentations. And um, again, welcome to Tijuana River Action Month. And um, I'm Lorena Warner Lada. I'm with the Tijuana River National Estuarine Research Reserve and California State Parks. And I'm joined by Stephen Wright with Four Walls International. And I will um, give him a proper introduction in just a moment. I just wanted to orient people to the area that we are taking you today on our tour. So Stephen, if you could go to the next slide. So um, here you can see a map of the Tijuana River Valley, and you can see sort of the green belt, which is the Tijuana Estuary and the River Valley. And on there, you should see a yellow star, which is for today. We are at the entrance to Borderfield State Park. Um, next week, we'll be at Spooner's Mesa. And the last week we will be at Monument Mesa. So you'll wanna join us for those presentations. But today we are traveling to the entrance to Borderfield State Park. So welcome to Borderfield State Park. We can get the next slide and you can see our entrance area. And this is an appropriate slide for um, tonight's presentation because this is actually part of the Border Gateway to Nature project that Four Walls International um, worked on. Geez, I don't even remember when when that date was um, now. I think the first phase was 2012. Yeah, 2012. So um, it's an exciting um, project and um, just invite you to take a look at that uh, sign for a moment and notice the wave underneath. Um, it'll become apparent in Stephen's presentation what is going on there and why this presentation is titled The World is Littered with Opportunity. So our presentation today is going to start here at the entrance area and um, since 2012, Four Walls International has uh, worked on the projects. And so Stephen is going to give us an idea of, of what's happening currently. So um, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and read off uh, Stephen's bio so that um, if you haven't met him before, um, you have an idea of, of um, our excellent speaker we have tonight. So um, Stephen Wright so for, works for Four Walls International and has Four Walls International has worked in Los Laureles Canyon, Goat Canyon, for 10 years, repurposing thousands of scraps of tires, plastic, glass bottles, marine bound debris, and sediment. They have a strong relationship with resident leaders, municipal, state, federal, and government agencies, NGO leaders, academics, elected officials, and private industry on both sides of the border. Stephen Wright's Bachelor's of Science in Evolutionary Biology, Master's in Social Innovation and Sustainability, and Certification in the Pomegranate Method of Community Organizing Methodology makes him uniquely capable of navigating micro and macro forms of power. He facilitates collaborative sessions and believes that inequality and pollution are symbiotic. So welcome, Stephen, and just wanted to quickly say that if you have a burning question that comes up or a comment, please go ahead and put that in the um, comments. And at the end, we'll have a question and answer and Maria and Anne-Marie will be monitoring that. So um, welcome, Stephen. 
Thank you very, very much, Lorena. I am thrilled to be able to present uh, here in this platform this evening. That's very exciting for me. I'll start by just sharing a little bit uh, about this project, the Border Gateway to Nature. So this is a project that was catalyzed by the Opening the Outdoors uh, initiative at the San Diego Foundation. And we also got some support from SDG&E. Um, and it's a project, uh, if anybody uh, was, um, was going to Borderfield before we did this project, you might remember that it was kind of a foreboding place that you would get to the, the parking lot and there was some black chain link fencing with some plants growing through it and you could see the border field sign, but there was just a couple small places that you could like go through and the park just kind of didn't appear to be open and, and anybody that goes to that park knows that you would see a lot of people like pull up and turn around and go back because they thought it was closed. And so part of this project was really about just opening up the space. And as you can see, you know, this is where uh, on the right, right hand side of your screen, where the fence runs, there used to be a, a, a black chain link fence. And um, everything you see here was built with trash that was pulled out of the sediment basins at the Goat Canyon sediment basin complex, just around the corner. And um, this particular wall, I believe was 250 scrap tires. If you see the serpentine retaining wall, um, that's 250 scrap tires. And I think that comes out to about 35 cubic yards of sediment. And that was all pulled out of the sediment basins and the seating walls and the sign you saw before along with um, the bollards is about 4,000 plastic bottles stuffed full of um, non-biodegradable trash, plastics, foam, wrappers, things like that. Uh, and, and so it ends up being about a thousand pounds of trash. Now, believe it or not, a lot of those bottles, we actually sourced upstream in Mexico um, in Los Laureles Canyon and we bought them. Uh, we, the idea is to incentivize these materials and we brought them across the border and we built with them. Um, but that I would say that was probably for about two, like half of the bottles that we needed. Um, it's a really fun project. It was one of my favorite places to work. It still is my probably one of my favorite places to work every morning because we go early, you know, and every morning you're driving down Monument Road and like every other light pole has a raptor on it, a bird of prey and red tails and peregrine falcons. And it's just, it is the, the absolute jewel of our region, I believe. And I always say, uh, you know, like, you, like there's San Diego, there's Tijuana, but right in the middle is California. Um, and it's just, uh, I think we're all on this call because we love it so much. But when it comes uh, to cross-border trash, we all have the same problem, right? This is a picture from those sediment ponds. This is right by uh, my house. Um, and every year this problem gets worse and the associated costs rise. And this actually reduced, like physically reduces the amount of environmental mitigation that is actually possible. And you know, despite valiant regional leadership and considerable conservation investments, this is a problem that is decades old. Uh, and in my opinion, it's because the symptoms are a result of the, of the border itself. Um, they make, the border itself makes it so hard to address these, these problems in a holistic and comprehensive manner. And regional experts, academics, and government agencies agree that no matter how we intervene or no matter the intervention, a sustainable finance mechanism is required for us to see measurable change at a large scale. We have to bring the money back so that we can do it again. Um, and with significant future investments being planned for the Tijuana River Valley, um, the board is the best management practice that is available to significantly lower those future operations and maintenance costs uh, and then protect those investments. So just a little bit of background. Um, we've spent the last 10 years building our argument for what we know to be true, excuse me, and that's that jobs and community investment upstream in Tijuana, directly upstream from where we built the entrance to the park, 
that is significantly less than what we spend dredging downstream in California. In our experience and what we've documented through our work history is that that sometimes can be up to 70% less by volume. This is also, in my opinion, a much better border narrative for our region. Um, we're very blessed to have been able to partner with UC Irvine and UABC Ensenada and working with them, we've been able to empirically prove that this type of social environmental impact bond is feasible and uh, particular to our geography even. And we've been able to address um, uncertainties in the financial structure that we had before. Um, in addition to that, we, uh, we're very lucky that we have some of the best impact finance experts in the world that are ready to help us structure this contract. This, would be, this is what is known as a pay for performance contract and it would be with the state of California. So the border impact bond is backed by brain power, policy, expertise, and deep community knowledge. We call, I'm gonna call it the bib from now on, all right? The border impact bond, we call it the bib for the urban drool, right? Um, and uh, this thing is a win, win, win all around, all right? These are literally the state mottos, right? So let's use private capital to create jobs and economic incentives upstream in Mexico, resulting in significant cost savings in dredging and landfill costs downstream in California. So impact capital assumes all the risk, public and environmental health improves on both sides of the line and the state of California only pays for success, not well-intentioned activity. And so once proven, and Los Laureles Canyon, which happens to be an isolated sub watershed system with 15 years of data, this model will be replicable and scalable across the numerous other canyons that are found in the urbanized portion of the watershed. But what exactly does success look like, right? This is Israel. I've known this kid since he was 10 years old and he's 20 now and the question has always been how do we make it inarguable for policymakers and investors that this kid and all the other kids like him are a safe bet you know we really needed a way that border authorities could independently evaluate our work and the impact of other interventions upstream so uh, working with Border 2020 and the US EPA, this is our current project, uh, we are creating a low cost, minimally invasive operational standard using drones or uh, UAS is unmanned aerial service, something, I'm forgetting the S there. Um, uh, but uh, we were creating this framework so that we can establish a baseline and use that baseline to monitor marine bound trash. Uh, we're gonna use it to target and optimize upstream interventions. And it's a tool that can help us to guide future cleanups during the recovery effort. Um, so first I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail here. Um, and the first thing we had to do was develop this survey plan uh, and establish it in three locations. So the three locations for this are Borderfield State Park and the Go Canyon sediment basins and a, a community called Colonia Milenio Dos Mil. Um, and that's upstream in Los Laureles Canyon. Um, the project survey times, uh, the first one we did was in February of, of this year. We're going to conduct another one in October of this year. And then again in February of next year, right? So at, at the end of rainy season, at the beginning of rainy season, and then again at the end of rainy season. Um, these uh, flights are executed at a relatively low altitude, about 150 feet above the ground. And that's because we're capturing images with the ground resolution of about one centimeter per pixel. Um, we ground truthed what we found from the air by walking uh, the sites on foot 
and GPS, GPS tagging photographs and debris descriptions, right, with, with smartphones um, at the different locations and, and uh, where, where we could find like individual trash and also accumulated trash and could identify it clearly. And the GPS tagging is done through that smartphone um, enabled digital survey sheet. And it's very accessible and easy for citizen scientists. Um, something that's uh, additionally valuable and worth noting is that the procedure and certification process that we have outlined um, is important. It involves multiple agencies at the federal, state, and municipal level on both sides of the border. On the US side, we have to do your standard um, California State Park Permit, and that includes a thorough review of FAA airspace restrictions. Um, and then also, you know, we needed to work with US Border Patrol to verify the content of collected imagery in case we were collecting anything sensitive with their facilities. Um, but we, we established a communication channel and a policy of data transparency with CBP um, so that we could li liaison with them before and after surveys uh, and ensure that the collected images didn't co co conflict with, with their policies. Um, on the Mexican side, we uh, discovered that we needed to uh, contact Aviación Civil in Tijuana, like the um, civil aviation authorities. Uh, we contact them in Tijuana and they would uh, make a note, but it also they would, they would alert local police as to our, our activities for added, um, <clears throat> for added safety. So uh, what you see on the screen right now is largely the work of our colleagues, uh, Napoleon Gudino and Josh and Schubert. Um, and uh, figure A is the actual ortho photo of uh, the Go Canyon debris basin complex. It's stitched together with 699 high resolution photos um, and is currently being used to test the various image classification algorithms using artificial intelligence to detect the trash. Uh, figure B is what's known as an isometric perspective view of the ortho photo and it, it shows a close up of the acquired imagery, right? It shows in the inset, you can see the accumulated trash and the debris boom. Um, of the upper basin. And we, uh, so we designated four locations within the ortho photo with different types of trash and trash accumulation properties and different types of background services like wet sand or dry sand, vegetation, no vegetation, shadows, no shadows. Um, and we did that to assess the suitability of these various image classification algorithms. Um, Obviously, what you see here in, in figure C, um, tires are the first item to pop up and I'd be identified in these ortho photos. And um, you can see that here. And these are some of the initial results from this uh, application of what I am learning is called a unsupervised maximum likelihood classifier. Um, so <clears throat> uh, this work is really exciting. It's definitely at the tip of the spear in the fight against marine plastics. And we're super excited that we're gonna be collaborating with Wild Coast on another project with the Benioff Ocean Initiative. Um, and that's where we're gonna be able to, to pair this with other AI initiatives um, in, a, in an opportunity to help establish a world standard um, for ocean plastics and, and mitigation. So um, again, I'll just reemphasize that we all know that our little corner here is very special, but in the fight against marine plastics, it is the spot because of that closed sub watershed system, the sediment basins, the trash booms, and all the years of data. So um, the science is confirming what we already know, right? Just kind of intuitively. And that is that most of the, most of this trash is plastic. It's reusable and it's recyclable in Tijuana before it ever reaches California. Now, <clears throat> this monitoring framework is critical for, for the bib, but to pass the policy that would actually enable it, right? It's never been done before. Um, we needed to set scientific precedent for upstream interventions across the international boundary. Um, and that's where the work of Matthew Brand comes in. 
This is super innovative stuff. Um, he is about to graduate with his PhD from UC Irvine, if he hasn't already. And what he did was he successfully took the hydrological model that our colleague Napoleon developed with uh, working with SDSU, uh, Trent Biggs Lab, and US EPA. And we worked with Doug Lydon on this. We took that hydrological model and we were able to marry it to financial forecasting tools. Um, and that's really exciting because it, it, when we did it, it proved the feasibility of financing interventions upstream in Mexico. This article that you see here, the very long title, uh, was just recently published in Water Resources Research, and it was selected um, by EOS.org as an editor's highlight, and it's getting a lot of attention, and so that's really exciting for us. This is a seminal work uh, that sets a precedent for this type of private-public partnership that we want to structure with the state. So with the, with the monitoring framework uh, and the published precedent established, we see this opportunity to make history reflected in current proposed policy. So this is a, this is a screenshot of the current state of Senator Wessel's SB 1301. Uh, it has passed the assembly, it has passed the Senate, and it's currently awaiting the governor's signature. Uh, it, it specifies, and you see it here highlighted, it specifies interagency and public-private partnerships. And these are two structural changes that we need. Uh, it also sets a precedent for preventative action in, in Mexico. The, our, we, our model we have had vetted by California uh, Senate and Assembly lawyers, and uh, we're hopeful that the governor will sign this soon. Anybody wants to, to write a letter in support of this to the governor, please do. Um, now, uh, in 2021, we will uh, be on to the last piece of the puzzle. Um, that is to develop an implementation plan for upstream interventions uh, in three identified hotspots under the guidance of the local community. Right? We have developed the bib because financial sustainability is a requirement. For, for large measurable change. The other requirement is, is uh, community ownership, is people having their voices heard. Because so many times institutions ask for input, they bring a resource to the table, they ask for input, and then whatever they spit out, they, they expect endorsement. And that is a lot different than making decisions together and going through a process together and everybody being at the same table from the community members up to agency uh, representatives and political representatives, everybody at the same table, micro and macro forms of power, making decisions together. That's where the real power lies and that's where the real sustainability lies. So the, the designed interventions that we'll do to get, that we'll make together will incentivize these municipal solid waste items, right, the trash. Uh, and incentivize them in their construction, right? The same stuff that you can go and touch at Borderfield State Park are examples of large scale green infrastructure public projects that, that we want to build uh, upstream and have figured out a way to do it. So um, once we do this, right? This is in 2021, once we develop these designs, uh, the engineering specs, architectural drawings, it will give us the principal amount of investment needed, right? And all the authorities and the community will be in lockstep. We use a, a process called the Pomegranate Center uh, process for community engagement or for creative placemaking. It's phenomenal. It works phenomenally well. It's a democratic process. And the idea is that we'll be able to, to get these designs from the ground up and it'll give us the principle. We'll be able to quantify the materials budget, quantify the amount of trash we're going to use, quantify the amount of trash that it will prevent and quantify the amount of labor hours that it will require because we need to create local jobs and opportunities. Um, with that principle, we will be able to run it through these models that Matt and Napo have developed. Um, 
Uh, and what it will do is it will give us the potential reductions in flows, right? And it will give us the correlated economic savings. Even more exciting, it will give us an appropriate uh, interest rate and the potential risk of failure. It's worth noting here that in the environmental impact bond world, one of the hurdles and uncertainties or obstacles was that you couldn't, it was impossible to quantify the risk of failure, that it wouldn't work. And that's why this work that Matt did is that we were fortunate enough to like be included as co-authors and is so important because it actually does that. Um, so uh, on the policy front, uh, we are hoping that the governor will sign SB 1301 this, whether or not a budget is appropriated to it, it gives us the legal toehold that we need to structure this deal and to put it together. Um, and so again, anybody wants to write a letter to, letter to the governor in support, please do. Uh, and again, finally, like I mentioned, um, we are really blessed to be able to work with some of the world's leading impact finance professionals. And let me tell you, one of them, uh, that 60 minute special came on and we got a call, man, he is frothing. He is red, like he can see it, he knows it. Uh, impact finance works, right? Preventative medicine is always cheaper. You throw in the economic dynamics of the border region and the disparity there. I mean, why spend dollars when you can spend pesos, right? So um, we hear it uh, all the time, right? Binational problem that requires binational solutions. Um, and if, if we can look, this is, and this is, my, this is my personal opinion, if we can look to and learn from the historically ignored corners and peoples of our region, we will find a way out of this mess. We will build a more resilient and dynamic community here binationally. There are thousands, there are thousands of people that will bust hump and work extremely hard to clean up the river, given the right opportunities, right? Given, given an opportunity for upward mobility. Um, and honestly, thousands will continue to arrive, right? The, with, with taxes being cut in the border region, I mean, the, and, and with the border basically closing, the border region is, is kind of the new land of opportunity. And so you can expect that Tijuana will continue to grow, maybe if not even faster, right? And, and that, will, that stress load, we will feel. But if we can get ahead of it, if we can create opportunities for people that are seeking it, there's no doubt in my mind that we can clean up this river and, um, and, we, can, and we can lower the amount of money taxpayers are paying to clean this stuff up retroactively. It is, it, it is always better to act than react. And like I mentioned before, um, with the significant investments planned for downstream, this is a legitimate way to reduce those costs for California taxpayers. Um, I also think, you know, we, with, with the migrant community and with um, these historically ignored communities and, and a lot of these canyon communities, these are, the, these are the people that possess the resiliency that we all must learn from if we are gonna build our mega region into a thriving, healthy one. Um, uh, th so this is my information. Um, please reach out if you have any, if you wanna talk or anything, but uh, other than that, I am, I am happy to take any questions and I'm grateful for uh, the opportunity to speak to you all to here today. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, I know every time I, you know, See your work at the border gateway um, to nature and hear what you guys are up to it always gives me so much hope and i know that a lot of times we you know are in the river valley i think of the tijuana river watershed and everyone thinks of all the challenges and it's so great to see things reframed into um, something positive and look at like you're saying opportunities instead of challenges and the way we you know, think about things really can make a difference and call people to action. So um, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and type those in the, um, I was going to say in the chat, but in, in the Facebook feed there. And Maria and Anne-Marie, let us know if we have any uh, questions that are popping up. 
So we'll give you um, a few seconds to type up some questions. Um, and um, while we're doing, while you're doing that, I can just quickly remind you that we're kind of smack dab in the middle of Tijuana River Action Month. So this year it is a virtual event and, um, and it goes through October 10th. And there are opportunities coming up this weekend. Tomorrow, uh, we have a National Public Lands Day presentation in the morning. Um, we have, uh, we're going to, if you're curious about the International Friendship Garden that's um, down on the coast, right on the, right on, actually on both sides of the fence, um, Dan Wattman with Friends of Friendship Park is going to be giving a presentation, taking you there called uh, Nature Overcoming Borders. We have um, Coastal Cleanup Day is always a part of TRAM of Tijuana River Action Month. And so uh, even though we're not doing big cleanups this year, we are still encouraging people to get out into their neighborhoods and clean up your local places because everybody lives in a watershed. So if you know that trash outside your door could end up downstream. And so um, we're inviting everyone to take action. So um, you can register, register through cleanupday.org for that. And we also have, um, if you have any children that um, like to do art, there's also a kids art contest that Surf Rider is sponsoring. And so 200 Action Month is just, um, a series of all the partners that are working in the River Valley and in the watershed. There are events happening in Tecate also and in Juana. So um, it's a binational event and we just take all of our partnerships together and create this opportunity for people to um, get involved so that we do have that hope and you know feel like we are contributing um, towards a solution to um, things going on. So uh, Anne-Marie and Maria, are there any questions that are coming through? No, <clears throat> excuse me. No, I, I don't see any questions coming coming through. Uh, um, I do. Ha I have a question, though. This is Anne-Marie Tipton, the Education Coordinator at the Reserve. And I don't have any questions on the t one Estuary Facebook page, but I have a question myself. Is that okay? Sure. Go okay. Okay, Stephen, uh, I have a question. Um, could you please go into more de detail about the green infrastructure plans, or is that a secret because you talked about it and I, and I haven't I, I didn't I saw uh, your partner developing something but can you go into more detail about what you want to do on the Mexico side please yeah absolutely so in the paper so the the so some of the interventions that we've identified as high impact would be things like in the canyon you have some places we call hard points and that's where you have like hard channelized canyon bottom hitting softer earth and when in the winter rains when that torrent of water comes down it blows those sections out and there's massive erosion events you also have like um you also have a lot of like uh, ephemeral gullies like stuff that'll erode out and then it'll become like a clandestine dump sink get filled back up and then those municipal solids will flush just like um earthly solids would um, the interventions that we've identified uh, that would that would be a starting point because there will be many more. But the you know you're looking at hard point uh, and channelization, um, hill slope stabilization, uh, native plant restoration, and um, uh, community centered waste management design. Right, so innovating waste management would be a big one. Um, but really you have, <clears throat> there's also a huge need to control for sediment and sedimentation. And so it's a way like if we can use the plastics and trash to, to also solve that problem, uh, it'll work very well. But the other thing is, is that these all need to be, they need to result in like beautiful park places and green spaces and um, walking areas and and so, and I, I almost hesitate to, to start to throw stuff out because really the key is to go in there and kind of shelf our own ideas and ask people what they want to do because they already know what they want to do and they already know what's needed. It's really a matter of like putting the humble hat on and being like, all right, guys, there's a resource here. We have a couple bottom lines. 
what do you guys want to trade for it? What do you, like, what do you, what do you want here? And um, it's incredibly powerful stuff. So again, just to review, you're looking at um, stabilizing, like hardening the bottom there where, where you have these blowouts, stabilizing hill slopes and controlling for erosion, native plant restoration, innovative waste management. Uh, I call it um, centrifugal waste management. Um, uh, so the centrifugal waste management programs, and then um, um, th there will no doubt be, and then, you know, the public and uh, green space uh, needs to be like a result of that. <clears throat> I hope I answered your question, anne -Marie. Yeah, thank you. Uh, anything else come in on the? No, nothing on the Tijuana River Action Network. Okay. Yeah, nothing over here either. All right. So, um, Again, before we say goodbye, I just want to um, just let you remind you of our, our last two tour stops. So um, you might have heard Stephen mention a few times the Goat Canyon sediment basins. And so if that sort of piqued your interest and you were wondering what those were, um, actually next week on October 1st, that is part of the tour will actually be even though it's one stop, usually we're standing on top of this mesa called Spooner's Mesa, and you can see out in the river valley, you can see to Cabrillo, you can see to um, the Coronado Bay Bridge. And so it's a great vantage point. So we'll be talking about the Goat Canyon sediment basin as one of the ways that we protect uh, the wetland, which is the Tijuana estuary, but we'll also be sharing some of our other approaches, including um, work that we're also doing in Los Laureles Canyon. So the same canyon that um, Stephen mentioned. So there's a direct connection to um, today and kind of a purpose on why we chose the tour stops the way they go. And then the last stop will be ending at Monument Mesa, which is right smack dab in the Southwest corner of the United States. And uh, Anne Marie, who you've heard from, will be talking about the history, the long and rich history of um, Borderfield State Park. So you won't want to miss those. So we hope to um, have you back next week. And if you have any questions that you think of after the talk, please um, type them in and we will try to address those as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Stephen. Always a pleasure. And um, yes, be safe and be well, everyone. Thank you, everyone.